Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today to Shy Hack Night. Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of my favorite Tuesday night um, activities to do in the city of Chicago. Uh, my name is Han. Uh, I am a co-founder with uh, my colleagues here for uh, Separate Argyle. We are a community initiative. Uh, and we wanted to sort of talk to you today about um, how you can co-conspire with the AAPI communities to fight for further change uh, for our communities. And so um, May right now is AAPI Heritage Month. Uh, we recognize that this month is a way for us to um, highlight the influence and the progress that we've made uh, in the United States for AAPI individuals. But we've also uh, are using this month to reflect on the much needed progress that we need to keep continue to fight for. Uh, and so we welcome everyone to uh, join us in, in this fight for a more equity for AAPI individuals in, in the state. So I'll pass it along to my colleagues and they can also choose themselves and we'll get started. Hello everyone, I'm Sandy Wynn. I go by she, her. Hello, my name is Jennifer Pham. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Good evening, everyone. My name is Trang Trang Hill. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and we're excited to be here tonight. So I have the pleasure to kicking us off with a very exciting activity. I know typically on these live streams, it's, you know, you're just doing a little bit listening, but we wanted to uh, take some time to test a little bit of your knowledge and friendly competition. So if folks can um, uh, either on your computer, if you're watching on your computer or laptop, or if you're watching on your cell phone, um, you may want to open up a new browser and go to uh, www.kahoot.it. Um, we have four questions that we want to ask the audience. So we'll give it a moment for folks to log on. So it's really simple. So um, open up a new browser on your computer or on your cell phone. You do still need to see the live stream link as well to participate so that way you can answer the question. So www.kahoot.it and then you'll be entering the game pin. So the game pin is 1350383. So I'm going to go ahead and um, pull up the screen of what you should be seeing. So we have some folks in the room here. We have Eric. We have Freddie that's joined us. So um, again, go ahead and log in. You can pick a cool, funky nickname, or you can just be you. However you want to bring your competition to this uh, little trivia that we have. Again, I want to emphasize friendly competition, right? Um, so we want to just you know get everyone excited a little bit more about our conversation that we're going to have tonight to share a little bit more about AEPI community. So I'll actually let me turn on the sound because there is some some trivia music in the background as well. So we'll give it another, let's say another minute. So again, please visit www.kahoot.it, put in the game pin, and then we can get started. So we have SG in the house, we have Josh on the board, Michael, we have someone named Dee, Eric, Freddie, Zach, and So. I know there's about um, a good handful of folks that are watching on the live stream. So um, go ahead and log in and we can get started. And then how the game works is you want to be able to answer the question as quickly as you can, but as fast as you can. The quicker you answer the question correctly, the more points you will be um, awarded. So the goal of the game is to answer the question correctly and as fast as. Um, if you answer the question incorrectly, of course you don't get those points at all. So again, we wanted to kind of, um, you know, liven up the evening tonight with some friendly competition. So give it about 30 more seconds for folks to log on. And if you are not in the trivia mood, no worries. You can follow along and watch as um, the other audience members um, answer the question. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hit start. So you'll wanna look at the live stream to be able to see the responses and then you'll answer on your device. So first question, 
In the 18th century, which AAPI, which stands for Asian American Pacific Island Group, was the first known to settle in the U.S. And where did they settle? Chinese immigrants in California, Japanese immigrants in California, Filipino immigrants in Louisiana, or Indian immigrants in Maryland. All right, we had five people answer, so let's see. So a mixture of responses. So yes, you you know, based on history and what you've heard, you know, a lot of folks, um, you know, were learned that it was Chinese immigrants in California, but it actually was Filipino immigrants in Louisiana. Um, they, uh, the first Asian immigrant settlement was established by Filipino fishermen. The fishing village in the marshlands of present day Louisiana was settled by the Manila men as early as 1763. So. That's a, a new fun fact for you to learn. All right, so Michael is the only person that got that point because he's the only one that got that question correct. All right, let's go. Word cloud. So folks can type into your device, name one prominent Asian American. You have 30 seconds to think about this. Awesome. So out of the responses that we received, um, these are some great responses. So Tammy Duckworth, obviously, right, because we're in Illinois. Um, Kamala, our vice president, Cal Penn. Um, Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan are two that are the most well known. There was a survey that was put out recently. And unfortunately, out of the 3000 people that were surveyed, 42% said they didn't know uh, Asian American prominent figure. And um, then the other folks, you know, listed Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, Connie Chung. So again, this is kind of emphasizing there is a sense of invisibility of Asian uh, Americans in media or just kind of well known in terms of prominent figures. So I'm proud of y'all that there is three names on here that was not listed on that other survey. So good job. All right, question three. Which neighborhood slash area resettled an influx of Southeast Asian refugees in the 1970s and 1980s? Devon Street in West Ridge neighborhood, Argyle Street in Uptown, Chinatown in Arrowsburg neighborhood, or Bryn Mawr Street in Albany Park neighborhood? Yeah, so folks excited that out of the five that answered, four of you got that correct. So yes, yeah, so in, um, we'll share a little bit more about that history uh, in terms of Asian Argyle and Uptown neighborhood, but I'm, I'm excited that a lot of you folks understood sort of the history there in terms of the Southeast Asian refugees. All right, let's see what we are on the scoreboard. So Michael, you're holding strong. Lawrence, you're not too far behind. So we have one question left. So. Um, we're going to see who will take the, the lead in this. Over blank anti-AAPI hate crimes were reported in 2020. Over 500, over 1,000, over 2,000, or over 4,000. So the correct answer was over 4,000. So unfortunately, no one got that right. But I think it's because that there is a de time delay. So folks may not be able to answer the question um, as quickly as you can. So I do apologize about that. But, um, but yes, we'll dive a little bit deeper in terms of the statistics, in terms of the number of reported hate crimes and violence against the AAPI community. So with that said, let's see where the podium stands. So in third place. We have Eric, give yourself a round of applause, Eric. Second place, we have Lawrence. Good job, Lawrence. And in first place, let's see, Michael. So Michael, kudos to you. Give yourself a pat on the back for 
for winning our AAPI, tri AAPI trivia this evening. All right, so bragging rights for those folks. So in terms of wrapping up this section, you know, we wanted to kind of debunk some myths in terms of things that you may have heard or learned about the AAPI communities. Other things that we wanted to just to highlight is, you know, the Asian Pacific Islander community is not a monolith, right? So here's a visualization in terms of Asia as a continent. It's a huge continent and region and understanding that there's so much diversity with, that exists within Asian Pacific Islander community. So as you can see here from the East Asia, Southeast Asian, South Asia, Oceania, um, the Micronesia Asian island. So again, just really um, encouraging everyone to understand the history and the background of AAPI communities. Um, here are just a quick snapshot of the AAPI groups in the United States, the, the most um, ranked in order of population. So you have Chinese, Filipino, Indian, all the way to Burmese, Indonesian, Nepalese. So again, another example of how diverse the Asian Pacific Islander communities are and the experiences, and the heritage that everyone brings. Um, in the greater Chicagoland area as well, um, most AAPIs live in Cook County than anywhere else in Illinois. So you may notice that in terms of the different neighborhoods that we have in the greater Chicagoland area. This map kind of visualizes a lot of different Asian Pacific Islander communities in the suburb areas as well too. So again, just emphasizing that even in our own state of Illinois, there is a rich diversity within the Asian Pacific Islander communities. Um, another thing that we wanted to emphasize too was a lot of times like in media, sometimes, um, you know, we hear certain narratives of certain um, dominant Asian Pacific Islander groups and the, you know, stereotypes or bias of all, all Asians are successful or, you know, or all Asians are Chinese and there's this sort of this narrative that, that perpetuates that Asian Pacific Islander um, individuals or communities are successful and if you look at this visual here, you'll see that there's a huge wage gap in terms of earnings in terms of different Asian Pacific Islander community groups. So for example, if you look at Cambodian community, 60, per, 60 cents in terms of um, Taiwanese, which is $1.21. So there's a lot of disparities that exist within Asian Pacific Islander communities. And it's important for us to understand that everyone's experiences and community groups are different. And sometimes they're overshadowed by the narratives that are being pushed through media, through the art, what we learn in school or what we even see day to day in our um, workplace. So with that said, I'm gonna invite uh, Sandy Wen to kind of walk us through unpacking the Asian American experience. Thank you. The last thing I wanna highlight is um, the question that we wanna leave you with this question is, have you taken the time to learn the background and cultural heritage of your AAPI community members, friends, colleagues and family. So I encourage you all to kind of reflect on that question as we are going through this presentation. So Sani. Thank you. And I apologize, my voice is a little bit uh, raspy right now, but hopefully you guys can all hear me. But um, I'm packing the Asian American experience. As mentioned before, Asian Amer Asia, anti-Asian discrimination is nothing new in the US and has a long historical root. Um, for example, in the early 1800s, it began with the trope of Asians are here to take our jobs. This expression led to legislative rulings and racial violence. Started off, for example, the Chinese massacre of 1871 resulted in rioters attacking a small Chinese community, lynching 19 Chinese men and boys, and yet no one was ever punished. Then we have the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which banned Chinese immigration until 1943, the first legislation ever restricting migration, immigration targeting a spit specific race. Then in the early uh, 1900s to 2000, Asian immigrants were subjected to um, horrendous racial violence, miscategorizing Asian Americans and blaming them for their foreignness. For example, during World War II, the US government forced over 117,000 Japanese Americans into internment camps, seizing property and assets. And in eight, uh, 1982, um, a Chinese American um, individual by the name of Vincent Chen was beaten to death and miscategorized as Japanese um, and blamed for Japanese taking their jobs. Um, and 9-11 only exacerbated the xenophobia, but this time inspired Islamic phobia. For one example, um, a Sheikh American gas station owner was murdered for wearing a turban, mistaken for being Muslim instead. Moving on to the next slide. Um, as a response to the Asian population growing in America, the term Asian American was coined in the 1960s, close to the civil rights uh, movement. And these movements began to erupt as a response to the Asian American struggles in America. 
these protests led, uh, these protests were centered around um, our distaste and disagreement against the war in Vietnam. We started offering social services to Asian American communities, fighting evictions and displacements, among other things. Legislative change was occurring for Asian Americans, during which the government finally eased laws restricting immigration and opened its doors to new Asian immigrants. For example, the Immigration National Nationality Act of 1965, which ended quotas limiting Asian immigration and provided for active recruitment of professionals and students of, from East Asia. In the wake of the Vietnam War, the United States resettled more than half a million refugees from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And while the first generation of Asian American immigrants fought for the right to na naturalize and the right to own property, essentially the right to be Americans, this generation in particular began to fight for their rights as um, Americans. Um, I also want to talk about this model minority myth. This longstanding stereotype belies a complicated reality for what is most, uh, what is the most ethnically diverse minority group. Asian Americans are often seen as the model minority for their social, economic, and educational success compared to other racial groups. Rooted in the pull yourself up by the bootstraps ideology, the term model minority was uh, popularized during the 1960s civil rights movement, but it is racist to both Asian Americans and other communities of color. The model minority myth is a stereotype that generalizes Asian Americans by depicting them as a perfect example of a, if they can do it, so can you success story. And yet here in present day, we're still struggling and facing with so much anti-Asian racism. For example, anti-Asian hate has drastically surged during the pandemic due to hurtful and false rhetoric from the previous administration, which has scapegoated the Asian community by referring to COVID-19 as China virus and Kung flu. Since March 2020 of last year, AAPI communities have felt the adverse effect of this rhetoric when nearly 4,000 reports of anti-Asian verbal harassment, um, violence, and murder. So now, whether you knew um, some of the history I mentioned or not, we challenge you with this question. What are you doing to better understand AAPI history? What unlearning do you have to do with AAPI history and narratives? And here I leave it, I pass it on to my colleague, Juan. Great, thank you, Sunny, for that. Um, Why well, sort of provide some high level data um, in terms of the pandemic effect on AAPI communities? Um, as Trang and Sunny has mentioned earlier today, um, AAPI have bared the brunt, the brunt of two pandemics during this year, uh, that of COVID-19 and that of xenophobia. Uh, when we look at sort of what happened uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, and let's, we're going to talk about small businesses and small business closures uh, in this first section. Um, there were about 600,000 AAPI businesses prior to the pandemic um, last year in March 2020. Uh, during the pandemic, within the first three months, um, a study by Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research showed that 25% of AAPI businesses closed within the first three months of the pandemic, and they're not returning ever again. So that's over 150,000 AAPI small businesses wiped out in the first three months of the pandemic. Uh, another sort of survey from the Federal Reserve also showcased um, that when they asked API small businesses how they thought that their financial conditions was this past year, 80% of them said that their financial condition was poor. 80%. This is higher than any other demographic group surveyed in the Federal Reserve 2021 report. Uh, and then what, again, in another survey by the Federal Reserve uh, for 2021, uh, when they asked again, how what percentage of, of folks feel like they've lost revenue during this pandemic, 90% of AAPI owned businesses reported uh, a decrease in revenue during this pandemic. And that again is higher than any other demographic uh, that has been affected during this pandemic. And we recognize, again, that all demographics have been affected during this pandemic. Um, but we want to sort of highlight that AAPI-owned businesses have been affected, again, by not just 
the virus, but because of xenophobia. Next slide, please, Trang. Uh, we also want to sort of share quickly the rising unemployment rates of the AAPI community during this pandemic. Um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, again, in March 2020, uh, AAPI unemployment rates were at 2.5% or so, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, once the pandemic started, we saw a 450% increase in unemployment rates for AAPI uh, in that first three months of the pandemic. And as we have seen through this pandemic, um, AAPI make up a large percentage of the service industries. Uh, they work in your restaurants, they work in your nail salons, they work in your barber shops, they work as motel workers, as taxi cab drivers. And so far, AAPIs have had the greatest share of long-term unemployment. So out of 600,000 unemployed Asian American Pacific Islanders during this pandemic, 48% of them are still currently unemployed to this day. Uh, and that again is the highest percentage of every demographic uh, surveyed uh, during this pandemic uh, in the United States of America. Next slide, please. Uh, another thing that we've seen aside from the impact on small businesses is the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes in the United States. We witnessed the tragedy that happened in Atlanta when AAPI women lost their lives. Um, and 66% of AAPI women have faced hate incidences during this pandemic. Um, this is also not just um, an incident where um, it is just verbal harassment, it's also physical assault. Uh, there's coughing and spitting. Um, there's also shunning and physical avoidance. And it happens uh, frequently at businesses. It happens frequently frequently outside uh, on the streets in public surroundings. Uh, so since the pandemic started, uh, there was a rise of over 150% of anti-Asian reported hate crimes in the United States. Um, that number has now doubled uh, in the last quarter of this past year. And so we have seen reported over um, 6,000 plus incidents of anti-Asian hate. Uh, and that is to also say that these numbers are underreported. Um, a lot of the experts have said that because of language barrier, uh, because of AAPI's uh, feeling um, like they do not want to be a burden to the system, um, they end up not reporting um, these incidents um, to the authorities as well. Next slide, please, Chen. Uh, the last thing that we want to sort of uh, leave you with is, you know, when you talk to Asian Americans during this pandemic, eight in 10 Asian Americans have said that they believe violence against them is increasing in the United States. Uh, in that percentage itself, half of them have actually experienced uh, a hate crime incident um, that they believe is tied to their ethnic or racial background. And, and we know when we think about this at the local level, even here in Chicago recently, uh, an elderly Vietnamese man uh, went for a walk one night and he was accosted and assaulted um, by someone on the streets. So we want to sort of bring this to your, to your attention because we want to make sure that these are not just data points, right? These are not just statistics of Asian American elders, of Asian American children, of Asian American professionals in the United States. These are real people with real stories and right now, a lot of folks who are Asian are scared. Uh, they're, they're scared of going to the grocery store. Uh, they're scared of taking public transportation. Um, they're scared of even going out for a walk. Um, and so one of the quotes that we'll leave you with is uh, from a, a survivor of a hate incident. And she said, I'm scared to leave my house. If people beat me, I can die right away. So we want you to recognize that, again, these are not just data points. These are real people who are suffering right now and living in fear for their lives. Um, the last question that I will leave you with is whenever you're out at the restaurants and you see hate crimes happening, what are you doing to stop that from escalating? Whenever you see someone disparage 
Asian American communities or an Asian American member, what are you doing to stand up for that person? How are you stopping that rhetoric? Um, and so this question that we pose, uh, this is again for you to think throughout this conversation is, how are you using your privilege and influence to stand up for AAPI communities during this time and beyond this time? I'll uh, hand it over to my colleague, uh, Jennifer. Thanks, Juan. So let's talk about Asian Argyle. Asian Argyle is located on the northeast side of Chicago within the uptown neighborhood. The Argyle area first became popular with Asian population in the 1960s when Jimmy Wong, a Chinese American businessman, proposed the idea of a satellite Chinatown in northern Chicago. Then in the 1970s, following the Vietnam War, an influx of Southeast Asian refugees migrated to the Argyle area of uptown. So here is the roots of Argyle mural. Um, John, yeah, to show the history of the diversity and generational migration of the area. So in the early days, the area was populated by German and Swedish farmers. And in the 40s and 50s, an influx of new immigrants, such as Appalachian Americans from the South, Native Americans from the Midwest, and Japanese Americans returning from the internment camps. And as they moved up the social ladder into different parts of the city, other immigrants from East and West Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia migrated to Uptown Chicago. Because of the strong Southeast Asian and Asian presence and ownership, in 2008, community members came together and named the area Asia and Argyle. Next slide. Having a sense of community unites us. Um, you can, you know, being a part of community can make us feel as though we are part of something greater than ourselves. It makes us feel safe and secure. A strong community can greatly benefit families and businesses. And as part of a strong community, we are part of a group of people who want to help each other, whether that is socially or professionally. And food is what we have to come together and to create something with one another, to talk over, to enjoy with. And it is where families come together and build beyond their families and create a stronger community with other families. And uh, food and community is inseparable. So what and why celebrate Argyle? What is Celebrate Argyle? Celebrate Argyle is a community initiative that aims to shine a spotlight on immigrant owned restaurants and businesses in the West Argyle Historic District as a unique culinary destination while also connecting community members to critical resources to meet pressing needs through the pandemic and beyond. Celebrate Argyle hopes to amplify the community's rich immigrant stories, those that shape, define, and impact Asian Argyle. We are all volunteers with full-time jobs and care very deeply about Asian Argyle. Next slide. Um, so we are co-creating and, um, and community solutions. So it's with community by community and it's uh, inclusion and connection and unwavering authenticity. Next slide. And how are you lifting up and elevating API voices in your community? Next slide. Have you taken the time to learn the background and cultural heritage of AAPI community members, friends, colleagues, and family? What are you doing to better understand AAPI history? What unlearning do you have to do about AAPI history and narratives? How are you using your privilege and influence to stand up for AAPI communities? And how are you lifting up and elevating AAPI voices in your community? So co-conspiring and call to action, what are some ways that you can help the AAPI community? So one thing is to experience and to immerse yourself in the culture. You can visit Asia and Argyle this Saturday, May 29th, between 12 to 9 p.m. as we celebrate Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Hi by Yo and Q Ideas will be partnering up with local businesses on Argyle Street to present storefront pop-ups, musical acts, cultural performances, AAPI book sales, walking art gallery, interactive art wall, music, and so much more. Uh, the second thing that we would encourage for folks to do here uh, to co-conspire with the AAPI community is to support the, uh, the TEACH Act. This is the Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History Act uh, that was recently today just passed in the Illinois Senate. Uh, and the act itself is advocating for AAPI history to be taught in public schools all throughout the state of Illinois. And uh, once it gets signed by the governor, 
Illinois will be the first state in the country to have a mandate mandate for teaching API history in public schools. Um, so if you're not in Illinois, we encourage for you to advocate for a similar teach act in your respective states. Uh, another thing that we'd love for you to advocate on is the new federal level anti-Asian hate bill that was recently signed by the president. And this allows for Asian Americans to better be able to report uh, hate crimes against them as it removes some of the barriers of language access um, that prevents Asian Americans from engaging uh, with government. So we would encourage you to support, again, the teaching of API history in public schools and to support uh, the anti-Asian hate bill. Um, and lastly, another call to action that we're asking for is advocate. Um, ensure AAPI representation and engagement at all levels, whether it's your work or community. And we open this up now to any Q&A that you have. Um, we're available to answer any questions. Great, thank you all so much. Um, so yeah, now we will turn it over to our Q&A portion. So um, for those of you in the audience to do please uh, keep those questions come in on the YouTube live stream. Um, go ahead and start the uh, first one here. Um, I guess to begin, can you tell us a little more about how and when Celebrate Argyle started? Sure, I think Sandy should take that, Sandy. I'm sorry, I, I misheard it. My um, my sound was down. Ah, no How did Celebrate Argyle get started? I guess I will step in. <laughs> so Celebrate, you got it, Sandy? No, can you take it? So Celebrate Argyle came together through actually Sandy's leadership. Um, there was a opportunity to partner with Dish Roulette Kitchen who provides um, uh, micro grants to uh, local restaurants in the area. And um, Sandy came up with the idea to really help bring this ability to Asian owned restaurants and businesses, speci specifically in the Uptown Asian Argyle area. So um, with some of the uh, seed grants that we received from uh, Dish Roulette Kitchen, we put together a digital media storytelling campaign to feature uh, key restaurants in the Asian Argyle area. So um, the reason why we were uh, emphasizing Celebrate Argyle is because the last 18 months, you know, there are a lot of things that we've been hearing in the news around the anti-Asian hate, the two pandemics that Juan referenced. We wanted something that was uplifting and to bring kind of celebration and encourage people to visit um, these Asian communities and not be afraid and really show up in solidarity with community. Juan, Nuki, or Sandy, I don't know if you want to add anything else about why we kind of created Celebrate Argyle. Sure, and I'd say one of the things that we, we really try our best to do is, is also meet community needs during this pandemic as well. So we, we've worked together with um, community members and with other groups and with restaurant owners to really provide them with the resources that they, they need to thrive during this pandemic and survive this pandemic. Uh, and that goes from you know, you know, delivering uh, mutual aid efforts and food boxes to folks in the community, uh, to providing PPE products, to you know, providing uh, you know, Nookie here runs a pharmacy here on Argyle that we're really fast tracking uh, the vaccines for those most left behind in our communities uh, on Argyle. Uh, and in addition to really trying to help restaurants, um, you know, qualify for PPP loans, qualify for Small Business Administration uh, grants um, that were recently, um, you know, pushed out and really wanted to, again, make sure that we bring these critical resources uh, to the neighborhood and to the community to make sure uh, that the community uh, prosperous as well. Great, thank you. Um, Eric, do you want to take the next question or? Yeah, uh, so we had a question from the audience. Um, Sam Evans is wondering, uh, her question is, so much of people's beliefs stem from misinformation. What are some common resources we can point people to to have in conversations with friends and family? Yeah, um, I can take that. So there is 
just a lot of different things that we've been seeing online, especially social media, a lot of, um, you know, organizations, local organizations, especially um, Juan, if you want to speak to the one that I just re recently received a gazillion dollars of money, the Asian American Better Foundation. Juan, do you want to talk a little bit more about that and what they're yeah, doing? Yeah, so the, the Asian American Foundation um, is a philanthropic entity that was just started uh, by Sanal Shaw and uh, a few other uh, prominent Asian Americans in the space. And this really, um, they were able to fundraise over a billion dollars uh, when they first launched. And this money is going to be going towards investing in AAPI communities. It's going to be towards investing in AAPI advocacy efforts, AAPI organizing, AAPI nonprofits um, that are serving uh, immigrants and refugees from Asian and Pacific Islander backgrounds. So um, that uh, is a great foundation for folks to be uh, on the lookout for, the Asian American Foundation. A couple other resources um, for advocacy is looking at um, the, the fantastic work that Asian American Advancing Justice has done in the space. Uh, we have a very amazing chapter in Chicago, uh, and that chapter has been very in instrumental in pushing for the TEACH Act to be implemented in the state of Illinois. Uh, and then again, uh, there are many other um, very strong AAPI groups, uh, as well as the Asian American Advocacy Fund um, um, that are also out there. But we would definitely encourage you to check out some of the ones that were mentioned. And um, as you sort of go to the Asian American Foundation, you'll, you'll find a list of resources as well of other groups uh, that maybe be of interest to you. Something I do want to plug is PBS actually did a series on Asian Americans. Um, it's such an, a like, bunch of mini docu-series in terms of highlighting Asian communities. So I think in terms of using film and using that as a way to talk about, oh, I know I watched this recent documentary and having that be a way to start the conversation, right? Of I think sometimes it's hard for us to conversate with family or friends when it's something that could be when we talk about race, right? I think race is such a emotionally charged topic. And for some people, they're very uncomfortable. For some people, they're fine talking about it. But I think just finding those ways to have, start small, right? Whether that's a book that you read, a podcast that you listen to, um, you know, think about Netflix. I mean, I think about Netflix all the time too. There's so much more representation in terms of Asian Pacific Islander um, media. So I think sort of using that as a way to start the conversation and then really unpacking and having that dialogue. I think communities and people don't have enough conversation in terms of understanding, um, kind of developing that empathy for one another. So those are some of my key recommendations. Great, thank you. Um, just the next audience question. Um, so one person uh, has not been to Argyle. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that community around Argyle? Oh, that's a nooky question. Go for it. Sure, I can, I can take that one. Um, well, uh, I've, I've lived there my whole entire life in that area. Um, the area is full of mostly uh, Southeast Asian, it used to be full of Southeast Asian residents, but it has changed up a lot. The area is, there's a lot, you'll see a lot of Vietnamese restaurants, bakeries, and also Vietnamese Chinese grocery stores and gift shops. It's an area where the community is really tight knit. Everyone kind of takes care of one another. And it's also, um, pretty strong in community. And when I say that, I'm saying like, for example, in my personal case, right? My father was the first Vietnamese business owner on the street. And from that, him and his friends have created other businesses. And then they just kind of have created this relationship where everyone kind of knows everyone. So you do feel a sense of home when you're there. I almost want to say it's like the underdog of Asian communities, right? You hear a lot about Chinatowns, Koreatown, if you're in LA, but we want sort of folks to know Asian Argyle, the uptown area, as being sort of the other mecca of Southeast Asian communities and with the restaurants, with the nonprofits that are there doing great work. And really this generation that's coming together to really want to create change and see this community thrive. So I think it's sort of the hotspot in terms of something that's going to 
thrive into something more. Since we launching Celebrate Arga, we've had so many people reach out and ask, how can they help? We want to do this. We want to like, you know, do some beautification projects or how can we support? So I think there is a, a desire to do more, but not folks are folks aren't sure how to. So I think we are trying to be that platform, that vehicle for people to, to come out and engage with community just because, you know, we know what gentrification will, will do and happen. And we don't want that to happen in this community, in this neighborhood. So come out and visit, especially Saturday. If you haven't been, Saturday would be the day that you would come out and come see this community just flourish. Um, so uh, another question we had um, is uh, from me because I'm a nerd and curious, but I suspect other people on the stream um, might have this question too, which um, would you say are some of the differences and strengths and weaknesses of like the organization that y'all started versus uh, like any SSAs or like local chamber commerces in the area and, and uh, stuff like that? Could you uh, re uh, rephrase that question, Eric, in terms of um, what are the differences that we're seeing from what we're doing and then in terms of what's happening in, in the space or? Right, well, yeah, so um, I guess uh, the, like y'all talked about forming this organization as sort of a grassroots organization and um, th there are also other like local community groups in Chicago, like in different neighborhoods, like different chamber of commerces or special service areas and stuff like that, that are kind of focused around community development. And I guess if I were to reframe the question, I guess it's kind of like, what do you see those organizations? Like what needs are they not, you know, providing or where do you see like the way that y'all can like work in concert with them maybe is a better way of phrasing it. And Yeah. So I, I, you know, there, there are, there is a lot of need uh, in the uptown community, right? I mean, um, there are a lot of fantastic nonprofits who are doing amazing work right now. Um, you know, we have one of the largest refugee resettlement uh, agencies in the state of Illinois in uptown. Um, and we have a lot of other um, nonprofits that are, you know, providing healthcare services, providing workforce development opportunities, providing, you know, basic essential needs for, for folks uh, in uptown and, and on Argyle. And I'd say, you know, in terms of our community initiative, um, we are not competing against any of these amazing, fantastic organizations. We are purely, um, you know, adding to, to the resources here. And, and we recognize that there is a, a lack of resources still. And so we're just adding to uh, the resources uh, and providing additional resources to the, the community. And the one thing that, you know, I think we've, we've really tried to be intentional about is to co-create with, with the community, right? It's really trying to understand their pressing needs and then seeing how we can kind of work together to build these solutions from the community itself, not from outside the community, but from inside the community and really, um, you know, encouraging people in the community to be change agents um, and to really, you know, take, um, you know, pride. And, and a lot of people definitely take pride in, in Uptown and Argyle, and, you know, so really want to sort of foster that shared solidarity in the community. Um, Nookie, Sandy, Trang, anything else to add on that? Real quick, yeah. So I think um, something that is maybe unique about our efforts is that, you know, day and age technology, the different generations that are all online, social media, because a lot of it is being pushed through these platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and it's quick, you know, digestible short vignettes of highlighting restaurants and people. And we actually were inspired by a lot of the different initiatives that we saw. So for example, in New York, they did an initiative called Welcome to Chinatown to get people to go out to dine in Chinatown in New York. And that helped sort of give the idea of like, how can we get people to go to Asian Argyle? It's through these beautiful imagery videos and using this as a storytelling campaign. So we're not necessarily providing social services like the nonprofits that Juan mentioned, but really just elevating, lifting and amplifying the voices that are already there in the community. And Jennifer, I know that you wanted to chime in too. Yeah, I think because Argyle Street in particular is so much more of like a, it's like a smaller community within the uptown community. And um, we speak different language in that in on Asia and Argyle. So I think 
Celebrate Argyle as a whole has just kind of helped with that and helped with the trust of the business owners because I am like I am one of the business owners and um, we've already kind of created a strong relationship and Hak Tran who is also one of the Celebrate Argyle members he um, is also part of the community and also works for the chamber and so I feel like this kind of just goes hand in hand with each other it, there's definitely no competition I think if anything it just kind of adds to the help of the community and and is actually creating more of a community. That answered your question. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, do you want you want to pick another question, Michael? Sure. Take the other one from the audience, which sounds like it's another Argyle focused question. Um, so, how did the Walk Street upgrade a few years ago originate? Um, I'm assuming um, this is about Argyle and the change to Argyle to be a little more wider and walker friendly. Um, so how did that originate and has it changed the character of the neighborhood at all? Um, so you're speaking of the streetscape plan that, um, well. I think so, yeah. Yeah, so that, as a community, we can say that it does look beautiful right but it has hurt a lot of the businesses a lot of the businesses during the time of the construction were not able to survive unfortunately so there's some mixed feelings about that like we we understand that you know change is ine inevitable and we definitely want the space to look better and to feel more welcoming but at the same time we're also you know we've also lot of, lost a lot of business from that and so we're kind of in this place now that, you know, there is a lot of construction continuing to happen with like the you know, CTA um, modernization project happening and the Argyle station will be closing for a few years. Us as Celebrate Argyle, we're just trying to do everything we can to get more business to the folks on Argyle Street and to just kind of um, create more visibility and um, create a stronger community right now because we are about to go through another um, another time of construction. The last thing I would say just to add on to Nookie is we encourage everyone to come visit Argyle Street again this weekend on Saturday uh, and really uh, immerse yourself in the experience and, and learn about um, AAPI history uh, and sort of, of have a good time. And again, we welcome you to come back anytime and, and be a co-conspirer with us in, in this fight for uh, equ equity uh, for all APIs in Chicago and, and beyond Chicago as well. Great, yeah, thank you so much. Follow us, you know, all on our social media, reach out to us. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in the works for the next couple of months. So stay connected so that you can just be um, updated in terms of, you know, what's going on and, you know, circle back with us, you know, hopefully six months from now, there'll be more amazing projects that are happening with Celebrate Argyle. So thank you, everyone. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I, um, it looks like all the links to the event and, and volunteering for the event on Saturday all got posted on, on the live stream as well. So hopefully everybody tuning in will check out all those links and follow you all on social media. Yeah, I know I will try to make it <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, I think that concludes the presentation and Q&A portion of this evening. Um, so thank you all again so much for joining us. And we'll, uh, for those of you who would like to stick around and do the three word introductions, um, you know, going to breakout groups and, and learn more about um, all those breakout groups that are going on this evening you can uh, join the post-presentation Zoom call. That will start in just a minute or two if it hasn't already. Um, that's the link that you can go to to join that Zoom call. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Eric, for hosting us today. We sincerely appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you. Um, so everybody, uh, stay safe, take care, and go, go forth, forth and, and have